Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, hope everybody's doing good today. Windy day outside, and uh, I mean, awesome weather. Uh, hey, uh, while everybody is uh, is jumping on, let me uh, let me bring everybody up to speed of of uh, where we are. And uh, again, getting a lot of questions about you know when will we come back together, and so. Here's the game plan. Beginning right now, uh, through the end of this month, uh, really through the first Sunday in June, uh, uh, we want to encourage you to continue to worship with us online on Saturday nights. Uh, invite a couple of families over to your house to worship with you. This is a step toward us coming back together. And... Uh, you know, two or three families together, worshiping. It, it kind of gets us slowly moving in that direction. Then on uh, the 14th of uh, June, we will have our first Sunday back together. Uh, the shelter in place uh, will expire on June the 12th for people 65 and up. So. We all should be in pretty good shape on the 14th, and so we'll come back. We'll probably be in two services that day. Uh, stay tuned for more information as we continue to, to work through the details on this, but it will be worship only. Uh, there'll be no children's activities going on, uh, no nursery, uh, uh, no children's church. Uh, everybody will be in the main, in the main auditorium. And so we will do that for the month of July. And then, hopefully, August, we, we are tentatively planning in August, sometime in August, for us to begin to resume uh, our normal activities. Um, we don't have a hard date on that because we really don't know this thing changes from week to week. And, and so we just want to kind of keep an eye and monitor things. But anyhow, there's a couple markers out there for you. Um, the, the target date to come back together is going to be June uh, the 14th. And between now and then, we want to encourage you, uh, as many of you as will, to just invite some folks, a uh, couple families over to your house, and uh, gather together and, and worship with us on Saturday nights. And uh, uh, we're going to get there. It's, it's going to come. It's going to come together. And so uh, thank you for your patience and for working with us through this. Uh, our, our folks have, uh, have really pretty much uh, been engaged uh, through this whole thing. Uh, and uh, we've learned a lot and we'll come out of this uh, better in a lot of ways. So uh, let me just encourage you to just to continue on and, uh, and just be listening and, and looking for uh, updates. All right, well, tonight uh, we take a look at another one of these letters to the seven churches in Revelation, uh, the church at Philadelphia. Well, let, me, let me read from uh, Revelation chapter 3. Begin in verse number seven, and to the angel of the church at Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you've kept my commandment to persevere. I also keep you for the hour of from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who are no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from God. And I will write on him a new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. Well, Philadelphia is the youngest of the seven cities uh, in Asia. Uh, it's colonized by the people of Pergamus when Attilus II 
was in power. Uh, the word Philadelphia is a word for brotherly love. It is said that Attilus had such great love for his brother uh, that he was called Philadelphus. And so the city received its name from him. Uh, it's called the city of the open door. Uh, the church was founded in a specific purpose of spreading uh, Greek culture to Lydia and, and, and Phrygia. It was considered uh, as an open door for the spreading of the Greek culture. And so they would understand when Jesus said, I've set before you an open door, that they were given really a missionary opportunity to spread the gospel of Christ. And uh, this church, like the other six, was chosen as a representative of a certain period in church history. Now, Bob, you write this down. Philadelphia is the church age of the open door. Uh, it's a time of missionary expansion, world evangelism. And there's some folks that, that believe that, that this period of, of church history spans from the time from 1750 until now. Okay? Uh, you know, they think of people like William Carey, the father, father of the modern missionary movement, who in 1792 became the first missionary to India. Uh, Adoniram Judson in, in 1830 uh, went to Burma with the gospel. Luther Rice raised money for Judson's work. And so it was a city of the open door. Uh, Philadelphia, the city, wanted to spread the Greek culture. Uh, Jesus is saying to the church, uh, you have an open door to go and, and spread the gospel uh, to, to the nations. But secondly, it was a city of earthquakes. In, in 17 AD, there was an earthquake that, that destroyed the city. And uh, quakes and heavy tremors continued for years. And uh, they were feeling shockwaves almost every day. And the people lived in constant fear of being swallowed up by, by the next earthquake. And some moved to the edge of the city to escape uh, stones that fell and some within the city actually lost their minds because of the strain others left the city into the country every time a tremor was felt and so there was a constant ebb and flow of people coming in and out fleeing and then returning to and from the city and so they understood when Jesus said I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God and you shall go out no more and so that was a specific reference to what they'd been experiencing. And so when the city was first destroyed by the, uh, the earthquake, Tiberius, the Roman emperor, furnished uh, funds to rebuild it. And uh, as a result of that, they named the city Nero's Caesarea, meaning the new city of Caesar. And, and later the name was changed to, to Flavia in honor of Flavius Vespasian, uh, who was really one of the most warped and corrupt Caesars. Um, and then the people would understand the words of Jesus when he said, I will write upon him a new name. And so their name changed a couple of times. And so in verse number seven, Christ uh describes himself. John continues his pattern of writing as he gives a brief description of Jesus uh, as it fits the particular needs of the church. And here's how it says, he who is holy, that's a description of God himself. Uh, throughout the Bible, uh, God is referred to as the Holy One. And the title shows that the Son is at one with the Father. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father, for I and the Father are one. It says, he who is holy, he who is true. Uh, he's the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he's the way to God. He's the truth of God. He's the life of God. And in him there's no shadow of turning for why? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so God is faithful through the ages. So he who is holy, he who is true. He who has the key of David. It's a reference uh, to Eliakim, the steward of Hezekiah. Uh, he was given a key to the palace, and no one could approach the king except through Eliakim. Uh, Jesus is the key to the access to God. 
No man comes to the Father except through him. And so Jesus, and Jesus alone is the one that opens, and he's the one that closes. And what he opens, no man can close, and what he closes, no man can open. And so this is a translation of verse number 8. I have set before you an open door, and no one can close it. He was giving them missionary opportunities because they had little strength, because they had kept his word, and because they had not denied his name. In other words, they honored his name uh, that is above every name. In other words, they believed and they treasured the word of God. They, they used their strength to spread the good news of the gospel of Christ. And because of their faithfulness in these vital matters, verse 9 shows the success they enjoy. Listen to what he says. He says, I will make even those of the synagogue of Satan worship at your feet. Here was a group of people that were passionate about getting the gospel uh, to others. You know, somewhere along the line, over the years, um, it's very rare, rare to find a church that truly has a passion to get the gospel to the nation. Our passion, sadly, is wrapped up in all kinds of things other than getting the gospel to the nations. And really, that's really what we ought to be about because the last words that Jesus spoke were for us to go to the nations and to make disciples and to baptize and to teach. But isn't it amazing how sidetracked and how distracted we've become over the years that we lose focus of the main thing that God has put us here to do, and that is to get the gospel to the nations. To the nations. That means you start where you are and you expand outward. And so most churches, if you took the cross, if you took the steeple off the roof and you took the crosses out, and uh, there's not a whole lot of difference in a lot of churches and clubs because the emphasis in the club is entertain me and the emphasis a lot of times in churches is entertainment it has nothing to do with getting gospel, the gospel out and so uh, verse 10 through 12 there's a promise for the overcomer note, note there's four promises that are made to those that overcome promise number one I will keep you from that hour of temptation which shall come upon the world. Here's a promise to the church that God is going to deliver it from the time of temptation. The great tribulation that's going to come. Uh, he promises uh, to rapture uh, the church uh, before the ultimate end comes. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to when that's going to happen. I mean, some think that it's going to happen before the tribulation period. Some people think it's going to happen during the tribulation period. Some people think it will happen after the tribulation period. Um, I think that if Jesus tarries, that we're in for some rough times. We're in for some rough days. And we begin to feel the tremors of it even now with the, the direction the culture has taken and uh, the anti-Christian, the anti-Christ, Spirit that is permeating the world. Notice the word hour. It shows that the church will not be here uh, for that. So some believe post-tribulation rapture. And, and what that means is the church is going to go through the whole thing. Some believe in a mid that the church will be raptured in the middle of the tribulation. Others will be our pre-tribulation rapture that the church will be taken out and uh, and so, personally, I think it's going to be early to mid tribulation. Just my thoughts. Uh, second promise, he says, "I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God." Well, well, what is a what is a pillar? Well, a pillar, what does it do? It represents strength and beauty and support. 
And the church is a pillar and the ground of truth. Peter, James, and John are called the pillars of the church. But notice, John saw no temple in heaven, for the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple. Now, what's the application here? We, we are to adorn, strengthen, and commemorate the grace and mercy of Christ in heaven. And so, when we get to heaven, it's not going to be about a building. Um, I think it really keeps in we become the temple when we of the Holy Spirit when we become Christians. And a lot of people get really shook up about buildings. And I think a lot of that comes to our Western culture because you look at other parts of the world and they don't have the buildings we have. The church in China doesn't have the buildings that we have. They don't meet in the same place the same time every week. They move around. They're underground uh, for fear of, of persecution. Uh, there's a lot of places in the world where, where the church cannot assemble like we assemble here. And, you know, people talk about God's house. Well, God's house is us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh when we get to heaven, the focus is not going to be a building. Uh, the focus is going to be on Jesus. It's going to be on the Father. The worship, uh, it's not going to have anything to do with buildings. It has everything to do with the presence of God. And so, he says that he would he he would make them a pillar in the in the temple of my God. And then he goes on and he says, and you shall go out no more. It's a promise of security and serenity to, to the people that had faced earthquakes and persecution and uh, every form of instability and, and insecurity. I mean, we, we look around. I mean, look at what we're dealing with right now. I mean, if, if your security is, it is wrapped up, in anything other than God right now, uh, you're experiencing a whole lot of anxiety. If it's in your bank account, the stock market's not doing good. If it's in your if in your career, a lot of people are laid off from work. I mean, if it's in anything other other than Jesus, I mean, right now, uh, you you're dealing with a lot of stress and anxiety in your life. I mean, here are here's a group of people that had faced earthquakes and persecution in every form of instability and insecurity. And, and, and God is saying to them, you know what? You are secure in me. You, you're, you're not gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this and uh, you, you're not gonna have to go out anymore. And he says, I will write upon you three names. He said, I'm right on you the name of my God. In those days, uh, this really communicated because slaves were, br were branded with the brand of the master showing ownership. Uh, in our day, uh, cattle ranchers a lot of times will brand their cattle to where they're branded. And so what's God saying? You're saying, he's saying, you know what? We are his. We're sealed with a brand. It's the Holy Spirit of promise into the day of redemption. Uh, in other words, when we belong to Jesus, he writes upon us the name of, of, of our God, and we wear the brand of our master. And so the foundation of God is sure, and, and we've got this seal. And that's how God knows we belong to him because God has invaded that God-shaped void in the center of our heart with the Spirit of God. And that's the seal that's upon our life. Secondly, 
the name of the new Jerusalem. Now remember how the name of the city had been changed so many times? Well, now they're given citizenship to the city of God. Um, there's no greater place to be a citizen than the city of God. And he says, and I will write upon him my new name. What does the Bible say? God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And this name will be given to those who overcome. I will write upon him my new name. Again, he closes with these familiar words. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, one thing I, I really hope that comes out of this, I really hope and I pray that this is a wake-up call for the church. Every mainline denomination in our nation is in decline, including Baptist. Um, I really hope this is a wake-up call and that we're shaken out of our slumber and, and that we recognize the fact that tribulation and trial and distress can happen. The Bible says when they say safety and peace, then sudden destruction comes. And we've gotten a glimpse of that in the last six to eight weeks. Three months ago, if you if you'd have said this would have this could happen, I mean, I don't know that any of us could have comprehended that something like this would happen. But now that it has, the words of Scripture ought to come ringing true in our ears, and and we really ought to be at a place to where the church is more determined and more passionate than ever to get the gospel out. And so, let me just encourage you to, to spend some time uh, in prayer. Spend some time in God's Word. Uh, take the opportunity just to, uh, to share Christ with people. Uh, Technology is a wonderful thing. We can, uh, we mash a button. I sit here with my phone right now and you know I don't even know how many friends I've got on Facebook I, I guess it'll tell oh I've got like 1937 friends on Facebook you know when I hit that share button it it goes out on my feed and and my friends are exposed to what is on my feed let me just uh let me encourage you to do the simple things. See, God doesn't ask, he, he never asks us to do what we can't. He just asks us to do what we can. And when we do what we can, then God steps in and he begins to do what we can't. So think about that this week as, as we finish our week out. Michael, we got any anything tonight? No questions at this point at all. Okay. All right. Um, well, I hope you're going to take the opportunity to, to call your mom, FaceTime your mom, talk to your mom this weekend if she's if she's alive, if she's with us, um, make sure that she knows that you love her. And um, I know I love my mom. And they're usually watching. I don't know if she's watching tonight. Uh, it's her birthday today. And so 
Happy birthday, Mama. I love you. Hope you all have a great week. We'll see you Saturday night.